let's talk about reframing the show. I wrote this lecture because I kept getting calls like this. 47-year-old female came in with altered mental status. Looks septic. She got in total a three-liter fluid, but her no repeat requirement is still going up. And her repeat lactate went from 2.7 to 3. Now, that's a phone call that I've received frequently. It's probably a phone call you guys have all made. As late. And I wrote this lecture because I didn't know what to do with that phone call. I didn't have an organized way of dealing with that patient. My shock mental model, the way that I had learned to think about shock, was inadequate to solve problems. And so I had to come up with a different way of thinking about shock. Because what we've all been taught, the sort of traditional classic distributive, cardiogenic, hypovolemic, obstructive, that's not necessarily going to get you all the way there. It does sometimes, but not for everybody. And I think it suffers from two problems. The first is simply one of my favorite quotes ever, which is that everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. And I think our traditional four-category model of Shaw is falling on the maybe you made it too simple. But increasingly, there's something else that we're beginning to understand about Shaw becomes really important when we're categorizing it, which is shock precipitance and shock physiology are different. Because we have this idea that if somebody is in septic shock, we use that synonymously with distributive shock. Turns out, unfortunately, the same precipitant, massive amount sepsis, the same precipitant can be associated with different shock phenotypes. So we're seeing patients who are in cardiogenic shock, but are actually vasodilatory. We're seeing patients who are in septic shock, but actually have profound right ventricular failure. And increasingly, the literature is teaching us that different shock precipitants don't just cause one type of shock physiology. They can actually cause distinctive subtypes of shock physiology. And the minute that you start divorcing this idea of the same precipitant causes the same physiology, the minute you start rethinking that, all of a sudden, this four-category model stops making so much sense. Because it really only works as long as patients try and stay within their assigned boxes. Now, we have another way. We have another model that we can use to think about shock. Our tank pipes pump up. Now, this model is much more useful to me because it helps me much more at the bedside when I'm really sitting down and trying to say, Okay, forget about categories for a second. Like, how do I just figure out what kind of shock this patient in front of me has? Because it basically, functionally, gives me an organized way to gather data with my ultrasound. Problem is that at the end of the day, ultrasound in shock, ultrasound is only a tool that you use to gather data. And to be clear, if you use this very sophisticated tool in a very sophisticated way and gather very sophisticated data, then go right back around and put that very sophisticated data in the exact same old boxes that you started with, you will have gotten yourself precisely nowhere. And so I think having an organized ultrasound to approach shock with is good. I think that we all need to be doing that, but that doesn't get you all the way there because ultimately you're just taking the data and putting it back in the same old boxes that we started with. And the biggest problem with these boxes is that they lead you to have a very limited view of treatment, right? Because if you're going with our four categories, if it's hypovolemic shock, you give them volume. If it's distributive shock, you give them pressors. If it's cardiogenic shock, you give them inotropes. Then nobody remembers what obstructive shock is anyway, so yeah. But similarly, if we use our ultrasound model, right? If it's a tank problem, we give them volume. If it's a pipes problem, we give them pressors. And if it's a pump problem, we give them inotrope. The problem with both of those things is that it doesn't really fix this problem. It doesn't help me with this patient. And I think with this patient, we often end up with this feeling. With, Kip, I've done all the thing, now what? And those models wasn't getting me there. So what's the answer? Is there like some fancy, expensive, newfangled technology that we're using? Sadly, no. I wish there was, but there's not. Is there a clever new algorithm that just got published and then it has some fun metrics for you guys to comply with in the ED, I'm sure? No, that's not the answer. We tried that one with sepsis, remember, and that didn't go so well. So I don't think it's a new fancy algorithm. I don't think it's a new fancy technology. To me, what I found necessary to improve my own practice was to think about shock different. Fundamentally, you've got to get it straight in your head. Shock is not about hypotension. Shock is about hypoperfusion. And blood pressure and tissue perfusion, they are not linked in lockstep. 
we have this idea that we should be, that if my patient's blood pressure is normal, that they're perfusing. And if only that were true, but it turns out it's not. Because what's really important here is less the macro circulation. It's less the blood pressure and the heart rate and the cardiac output. A lot of the time, really, what we care about, where the magic happens, is in the micro circulation with tissue perfusion. And it's really interesting. It seems increasingly clear that microcirculation and macrocirculation don't always march together. And some of the most interesting literature that I've read over the past five years is the literature talking about how and why microcirculatory dysfunction can be associated with adverse patient-centered outcomes in a way that's independent of macrocirculatory parameters. Meaning, just because your blood pressure is okay doesn't mean your patient's okay. Not at all. Now, this is obvious to us in some patients, right? I had this woman who came in and was a little old lady and had come in and got hit by a car. Now, she also had a history of CHF and they initially pan scanned her and everything was negative. So they admitted her to the ICU because she was a little hypotensive, actually. So somebody echoed her and was like, oh yeah, her heart looks really bad. Her EF looks bad. Decided she was in cardiogenic shock. So started her on a bunch of norepi. Had the little dopamine later. I come in the next day. And I'm told that she did great overnight. I'm told that her blood pressure is better. Everything's good. So I go in and I look at the monitor. As long as you look at the monitor and not the patient, everything seems great. Her blood pressure is 120 over 80. Everything's perfect. Then you look at the patient and she's the color of like gray socks. And she looks awful. And she's diaphoretic. And her lactate was like a million. And her base excess was negative a million. And she looked awful. Turned out she was bleeding to death in her leg. ET scan hadn't caught it. And we've been giving her massive doses of pressors and no blood. But her blood pressure was fine. So she wasn't in shock, Rahal. We can make blood pressure look beautiful. Doesn't mean the patient's pretty. So if that's the case, what's with our blood pressure obsession, everybody? I think there's two things. I think the first is measuring what's important, not making important what we can measure. Humans love to measure things. Doctors really like to measure things. We like data. We like measurement. Absolutely. Blood pressure, we can measure. We can write a protocol that says if the map is less than 65, the patient is in shock, must go to the ICU, do not pass go, do not collect $200, call it a day. Can't really write a metric that says if the patient based on multiple metrics of clinical gestalt is not perfusing their tissues, that's not a single number. We don't like that as much. Problem is that, yeah, of course, blood pressure plays an important role in tissue perfusion, but so do a lot of other things. And if we're only looking at blood pressure, we're missing the big picture of a really complicated machine. But I think our blood pressure obsession, I think it runs deep. And I think it's a human thing. Humans are just really into forward. When you go in an airplane, you know how they always have to be like, please remember the nearest exit could be behind you. Obviously, it sounds obvious, but humans are just really forward focused. And I think doctors, as humans, hopefully most of us, have this very forward focused hemodynamic worldview meaning that we're very focused on the forward pressures. It makes us very MAP-centric and very sort of LVEF, like LV systolic function-centric. Because we're like, yeah, forward pressures. The problem is with forward pressures, again, we're missing a really important chunk of the complex machine here. But it feels like it has face validity, right? Like forward pressure is so much higher than back pressures. Like we're thinking about blood pressure versus CVP, let's say. Blood pressure, we're talking about your map of 70, 80, 90, and your CVP is what, like 10? So it seems like it should have some face validity that forward pressure is much more important than back pressure. Turns out that face validity doesn't actually match the physiology. So if you look at a diagram of all the different levels of the circulatory system, from the aorta down to the capillaries and all the way back to the vena, and you look at the pressure at different levels of the circulatory system, what you'll notice is this. Firstly, Where does magic happen? In the capillaries, of course. That is where the tissue perfusion happens. That is what we care. That's all we care about. But now, look what happens. Because the biggest pressure drop in this system, where does it happen? It happens right before the magic happens. It happens in the arterioles, right before the capillaries. And so the thing is that when we think about arterial pressures, we think about forward pressures. Yeah, we think about 90, 100. But if you actually look, at what the forward pressure has dropped to before the capillaries, before the magic happens, we're not talking about 100 anymore. We're talking about maybe 20. And now all of a sudden, when we're comparing our forward pressure of 20 to our back pressure of 8 
10, all of a sudden that difference doesn't look so big. All of a sudden, maybe it doesn't look like this. Maybe we should actually be getting all excited about backwards instead. Maybe it looks more like this. It's a lot more evenly matched than we thought, at least with respect to actual tissue perfusion. Now, there's one other pressure that we have to take into account. We talked about our forward pressure. We talked about our back pressure. But there's one other pressure we have to pay attention to, and that is our external pressure and how that affects tissue perfusion. Now, here's the thing about external pressure. Sometimes external pressure is, hello, look at me, you can't miss me. Because we're all familiar with shock states due to elevated external pressure. What are they? Cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax. When a patient is in shock from cardiac tamponade or tension pneumothorax, we're not like, oh, give pressors to increase the forward pressure. No. We're like, yeah, we got to relieve the external pressure, right? Now, that's the most obvious case of an external pressure problem. But that's really the most obvious case because it turns out that there's another sort of external pressure thing that happens. That's not quite so showy. It's more like in the tiny but mighty category. And that is tissue hydrostatic pressure. And it's everywhere. But it matters. Because when we're realizing that the pressures, the forward and back pressures we're talking about, at the level of the tissue perfusion magic, we're talking about numbers like 5, 10, 15, 20. Well, all of a sudden, tissue hydrostatic pressures, they're low, but all of a sudden, as a percentage of the total pressure gradient we're talking about, they matter and they're everywhere. So I have stopped thinking about shock, like what are the four categories or pipe pump tank? And I've started thinking about it in a three model, forward, forward, and external, because that really helps me. Stop thinking about blood pressure and really start approaching shock as a perfusion pressure problem, not just a blood pressure problem. Now, of course, this isn't a newfangled idea. I didn't just come up with this. I wish I had, but I did. The thing is that there's a reason that this hasn't quite caught on yet, which is that if you map this out in the traditional way, it looks something like that. And reasonably, yeah, that's not super functional at the bedside. And so to me, what's really made a difference for me is coming up with a way, thinking about perfusion pressure in a way that I can actually use the bedside. Now, this is just the intro lecture to this concept, this idea that you need to really think about perfusion pressure as the sum of your forward, backward, and external pressures, and then bring it to the bedside. And the way that I bring this to the bedside is I just make a simple map of my patient's circulatory system. And then for a given condition, what I'll do is I'll sit down and say, okay, let's say I think that my patient, my hypothesis is right heart failure, and I will map out my forward, backward, and external pressures for that patient. And this is the key part. And by doing that, what that allows me to do is sit down and come up with a treatment strategy. And a treatment strategy that addresses all of the different factors contributing to my patient's hypoperfusion that often leads me to non-obvious conclusions that leads me to conclusions outside of just volume, pressors, and inotropes. That's why I like using this model. And I found that by reframing shock in this way, reframing shock to really focus at the bedside, not just in theory, but at the bedside, on hypoperfusion rather than hypotension, thinking about this three pressures model has made a big difference in how I think about shock and has truly increased my capacity to take care of those complicated patients.